Thank you. Really enjoyed that. You know, when I was in grade school, I never wanted to advance to the next grade. If it were my decision, I'd still be in kindergarten. <laughs> Fortunately, my parents didn't let me make those decisions at that age. But I, you know, Miss McGillicuddy in first grade was just fine with me. I was happy. I did not want any further challenge. I did not want to progress. I was fine in first grade. And I, I'd probably be teaching first grade right now had I stuck around. I'd know the material, right? The author of Hebrews is facing that kind of an attitude when he writes to them. And if you're an astute student, you're noticing something about right now, and you're going, wait a minute, you skipped Hebrews and you're going back. You already did James and 1 Peter, and now we're backtracking. Yes, it's true. That was my mistake. <laughs> I totally forgot Hebrews was in the Bible. But <laughs> I did go back. I am going to make up for my mistakes. So don't get that confused when you're reciting the books of the Bibles. Hebrews comes before James and before 1 Peter. Hebrews is where we're at. And the author to the Hebrews, of the letter to the Hebrews, is encouraging them, you must go forward. You cannot go backward. You cannot return to your old-time religion. It's not good enough for you. <laughs> He's saying you must move on from Judaism. Judaism served its purpose. It ushered in the Messiah. It prophesied and, and built the groundwork, but now Messiah has come, and you need to move on. No matter how politically incorrect that might be, you must move on. The book is filled with warning passages that scare the bejeebers out of a lot of people. In Hebrews 5, it talks about, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of God. So Paul, who I think is the author, he's never stated, but I just say Paul. So from now on, when I say Paul, you know that's my opinion. That Paul wrote Hebrews, he challenges them and says, no, you need to progress, you need to move on, you ought to be teachers by now. And you have need again for someone to teach you. He says, once you've been enlightened and tasted of the grace of God, it is impossible to renew you again to repentance. That scares people. <laughs> he says, the ground that takes in the rain and bears thorny thistles is close to being cursed. And I'm not going to go into the theology, but that's the key to that passage. It's close to being cursed. It's not cursed. It's close to being cursed. It's saved as through fire, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3. So it's not performing in the, in the way that it ought to. It's not progressing. It's not taking the blessings of God and doing the things that it ought to be doing. Instead, it's producing thorns and thistles, and it's close to being cursed and ultimately saved as through fire. And then Hebrews is also famous for the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, right, which actually starts in 1038, where the author says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Again, you get that theme. You must move forward by faith. Move forward. If you shrink back, my soul has no pleasure in you. And in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things uh, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So that's the theme, the message of Hebrews in a nutshell. Where I want to focus this morning and where you can turn in your Bibles, if you have them, or in the Pew Bibles, is Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. The author builds a very logical, meticulous argument for what he is saying here, that the Jews needed to move on. It was not an option to stay in Judaism. They needed to move on and accept Messiah as the new messenger. Hebrews chapter 1, let's read verses 1 through 4 together. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many ways and portions, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, the Son, is the exact radiance of his uh, the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. 
Here's the points I want you to get out of this passage this morning. One, God desires a relationship. God desires a relationship with you. And hence, he speaks and has spoken throughout history. God desires a relationship with you. Secondly, God relates to you through Jesus. He relates to you through Jesus. That's the way that God has chosen to communicate and to relate to us. And finally, we need to replace whatever religion that we're doing with this relationship. God is a relational God. He relates through Jesus. We need to accept that relationship and not go back to our religion. Those are the three points. God speaks. He reveals himself. The scripture here says through many different means. God spoke through creation, right? Psalm 19 says the heavens are declaring the glory of God. The, the, the heavens are uh, talking of his handiworks. He speaks to us through creation. He speaks to us through conscience. Paul wrote in Romans 1 that those who did not have the law, you and I, the Gentiles, who are not privileged with the law of Moses, have the law written on our hearts, our conscience. So God speaks through creation. He also speaks through conscience. He speaks through canon, that book you're holding. What a precious, precious letter from God. God speaks through that book. Timothy, to Timothy, Paul wrote, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that is inspired by God. God breathed literally and handed to you. It's in your hands. God wants to speak to you through that book and through your conscience and through the creation. But that's not all. God in times past also spoke through dreams and visions and these weird things called the Urim and Thummim that the Israelites used to use. I don't know what they were. I think they were lots that they cast to determine the will of God. God spoke through fleeces to Gideon. God spoke through miracles and prophets. He spoke through his spirit. He spoke through angels. So God throughout history has been attempting to communicate with us. God speaks. Why? Because he wants a relationship with us. He wants to relate to us. When I was in college, I got the big idea one Christmas holiday that I wasn't going to go home. I don't know what was going on. That There were probably some circumstances around it, but I decided I was going to stay in the dorm over Christmas. And, hey, I had plenty to do. I was going to decorate my dorm room. It was all of 15 by 15, and I figured that would occupy me for the two weeks of the holiday break. <laughs> After about five minutes, the room was decorated, and I was lonely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very lonely time. There was nobody else in that whole dorm. The campus was abandoned. There was nobody around. And though I'm an introvert and I like being alone, that was getting to me. You know, I was doing the Jack Nicholson, you know. <laughs> Here's Johnny. <laughs> I, was, I was lonely. And I remember going to the Lord and praying, God, I need a friend. I need someone to, to fellowship with. I need a, a soulmate. And I walked over to the Baptist Student Union, and guess who I met? She's sitting right here, my wife of 27 years. <laughs> God gave me a friend. She's been a great friend. My point is, I'm not designed to be alone. God said that in Genesis. Remember, it is not good for man to be alone. I, amen. I am with you, Lord, on that one. It's not good for me to be alone. You know why we're like that? Because God's like that. We're created in his image. It's not good for God to be alone. He wants to relate to us. He wants us to relate to him. He wants to have a relationship with us. God reveals himself. He doesn't conceal himself. He's been revealing himself through the ages. And the amount of revelation that you get is correlated to how much you want. <laughs> Somebody said you're as close as God as you want to be. As close to God as you want to be. That's true. The, God will reveal himself to you in, in correlation to your relationship with him. Relationship leads to revelation. Isn't that true in our human relationships? As we relate, we begin to share more and more about ourselves, and that relationship grows stronger and tighter. Before you know it, you're finishing one another's sentences. Amen, retirees? Hey, I can be counted as a retiree this morning, by the way. I happily put the retiree sticker on the back of my truck, and now it says, U.S. Army, retired. <laughs> Not just tired, but retired. 
But we get to, especially if we've been relating for a long time, we have this close personal relationship and we can, we can know what the other is thinking. That's true of God too. The more you relate, the more he discloses. The more you relate, the more he manifests himself to you. The closer you are, the more revelation you get. So the application here is we need to seek. We need to listen. We need to receive that revelation. We need to believe. We need to take the time to spend with the Lord to hear from him, right? We go through our busy weeks and we never think that maybe I should sit down and just think and listen and hear from the Holy Spirit for a little while. Or maybe read this book and hear what he has to say to me through this book. Or go to a fellowship where you're interacting with other people and they can tell you what the Lord's saying to them. And all of a sudden, hey, you know what? I had that same experience. That's how God relates to us. And he desires that relationship. Secondly, God relates to man through Jesus. He, he desires a relationship. He has chosen to relate to us through Jesus. The scripture says, in these last days he has spoken to us in such a one as son, or in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the world. And the son is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of a majesty on high. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. And you say, wait a minute, last days? That was like 2,000 years ago as he wrote that, right? How can we still be in the last days? Well, we've been in the last days since we got the last word, who is Jesus? We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. And who knows where that minute hand is on the clock? But according to Paul and John and Peter and James, we are in the last days. They all testify that this is it. Jesus is the last word, hence these are the last days. The Son. John calls him the Lagos. In his gospel, in his letter, he says, the word became flesh. The Lagos, the concept, the idea, the reflection of God became flesh so that we could relate to it came flesh and dwelt among us. He's relating to us in such a one as son. And he made him the heir of all things. He made him the heir of all things. Psalm chapter 2 says, Ask of me and I will surely give you, this is the father speaking to the son, Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your, as your possession." So Jesus is the one who stands to inherit it all. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, he is the leader of the meek. And by the way, don't confuse that for weak. <laughs> he is far from weak, but he is certainly meek. Thank the Lord. He is the word to us, and he inherits it all. The scripture says, through him the world was made. You mean Jesus was there in the beginning? Oh, yes, he was. Genesis says, Elohim, plural for God, said, let us make God in our image. Wait a minute. I thought God was one. He is one. So why plural for God? And why does he say us and our? Those are plural. Because of the Trinity. Because the Son and the Spirit were also involved in that work. You see, Jesus was right there 